we're going to explain um, the first couple of slides will explain the purpose, like I said, and then I'm going to give you kind of what you might expect, uh, like an in-briefing for a PA to be, where you'll get some basic uh, information for the dam that you're working on. I'm going to be vague on purpose, so I'm going to expect you guys to question some stuff that I uh, don't explain. If you guys have questions, if I go through something quickly, it's probably going to be on purpose. So ask questions like you were, like our little, uh, you know, uh, thing that we did up here. We had a little bit of back and forth dialogue, right? So you guys, I'm going to expect that you guys are going to have that same thing. So ask questions if something doesn't make sense. I say stuff wrong all the time. So it might be me. If it's, if it's not clear, go ahead and ask some questions. So this is uh, called turning data into uh, knowledge or site characterization exercise. Um, here's our learning objectives. You're gonna learn the process of site characterization model building. Um, what, what, is, what does a model mean to you guys? It's perfect, it could be an idea, right? It could be a cross section, it could be a 3D thing like Jen did, um, just did. You are gonna learn how to evaluate uh, geologic variability and how to incorporate uncertainty in a risk assessment. You're also gonna learn that the product that you create uh, must convey the knowledge you gain from the process and the key elements of your model that impact the risk assessment. So what's the goal? Um, we're gonna develop this model. That's gonna be the first part. Uh, you guys are gonna do that today. And then the second part is going to be doing this mini SQRA. The model, like you just said, is any uh, product that represents a concept uh, developed using scientific method and presents data to illustrate patterns uh, and a bunch of other geology stuff. The mini SQRA part is gonna be this, um, it, it, our, our you know, uh, qualitative approach to estimating risk. Uh, it's gonna be accompanied by developing a list of more or less likely, or accomplished by developing a list of more and less likely factors like we did in this little uh, exercise here. Um, we give you some loading, uh, so that's gonna be uh, used to select your critical load. Um, and then we're gonna estimate risk by plotting probability of failure and consequences, which we provide to you. So here's a quick format of how we'll do this. Um, we're gonna be guided by a facilitator, so each person or each group will have a facilitator. We're gonna meet each day, uh, so we're gonna meet today and also tomorrow and then on, on the last day to do a presentation. Like I said, we'll use this mini SQRA approach. Um, we're gonna develop that subsurface model. And uh, we're gonna evaluate a backward erosion PFM. Uh, we're gonna develop those more or less likely factors and then highlight some uncertainties. Your product at the end is gonna communicate this characterization to the group, you're gonna present it. And it's also gonna be this tool to organize data and understand the site. Here's our agenda. I think this is right. So the project in brief, what we're gonna do here in a second. Um, day one, this is your group work. We'll start that, it'll be two hours, 15 minutes. You're gonna have to do some data review. So I'm not gonna give everything to you. I think we have this split up into a bunch of uh, folders. And I tried to make it so that there's a variety of different information in these folders. So we have some hydrology stuff, there's gonna be some photographs, uh, some PDFs, so some reading, there's some graphs um, and Excel data, so a little variety of everything. So when you get into your group, um, introduce yourself, um, explain what you're good at. Like if you're good at reading graphs, say that, hey, I can, I can look at graphs, I can do that. If you're good at reading uh, instrument da instrumentation data, do that. If you, if you would rather read and, and try and uh, synthesize some stuff out of text, do that, okay? So there's a bunch of different stuff in there. And then day three, we're gonna do, um, day two, sorry, group work. Uh, you're gonna do this mini SQRA, just developing those more or less likely factors and then you're also gonna try and develop that presentation. And then on the last day, we'll do this uh, presentation. Just four slides, and um, those are what you're gonna have in those four slides. So this is just what I was discussing. Um, these are gonna be in your folders, and you'll be able to go through what's in them. 
Okay, so now we're going to talk about this in brief. Here's our quick outline, background, performance, um, some consequences, and loading information. So Denison Dam, I didn't even put the, put the name of the dam, did I? Huh. Um, Denison is located down here, the, uh, right there. Actually, the states don't show up there good, but it's on the uh, border of uh, Texas and Oklahoma. Here is uh, our site. Uh, so the main things we're gonna point out, big long embankment, uh, intakes over here. We have uncontrolled spillway here with a stilling basin, powerhouse, outlet works. It is uh, on the Red River. Uh, it's about 15,000 uh, feet long. It's completed in 44, it's 165 feet tall. Uh, embankment crest elevation 670 and uh, spillway crest 640 and the pool of record was 2015 so fairly recent and it was 645.7 and this is where I'm going to go through stuff so if something go ahead I don't know uh, spillway crest 640 embankment crest 670 and you're going to have a copy of this as well. So this is one of the pieces of information that somebody will um, get to review. So this is our foundation plan. Uh, I just took this and kind of marked it a little bit with some of the mm, more main features, I guess. It has a, a sheet pile cutoff for a portion of it. I can't read the station, 90 plus something. Then they transitioned to a cutoff trench. So they excavated down to something they felt was impermeable, put the core on that. Uh, and then it's got a sheet pile cut off here. Burns Run is, a, is an interesting feature. Uh, it's an old uh, channel essentially, and they had a lot of problems with seepage going through that area during construction. It was um, mostly sand, like we were just hearing about lots of sand problems. So a lot of seepage going through sand foundation. Co drain trench runs along most of it. Uh, there's a blanket, co drain, and then it, and out here we'll look at some cross sections that kind of go further on the left abutment that show it, it, it changes a little bit. So this is our profile. I think we're looking upstream. And so who can, who can describe this shape, that shape, and that shape? What does that like remind you of? What? Terraces, yeah. So they have what they just called, they just, I think they just called it, let's see what, fine sands, gravelly at base. They kind of describe it as overburden in most places, but you'll find that it's um, quite a bit more detailed than just overburden. That's in some of the information we'll look at here in a second. Uh, then the foundation for this, the bedrock, so to speak, is the Trinity sand, makes this part, uh, Kayamichi, Goodland limestone, and these duck creek members up here are shales mostly. And also, I forgot to mention that we have the, the, uh, the expert that put all this together in the back. So if there's any specific questions, yeah, she's like hiding. She did uh, all of the work on Dennis, and, and so she's the expert. Um, so if you have specific questions, we'll ask Amy in the back. <laughs> Here's a couple of typical cross sections. So this top one here is at the main river valley, sort of the maximum section. In general, the, the, all of the sections look fairly similar. Um, they have an upstream impervious core. And then these downstream areas, the one in green and then this guy here are random pervious and then pervious fill. So this is like more granular. The main differences between the couple of sections that, and, the, and these go further up, uh, up the abutment. So Burns Run is that blue area that I highlighted. And then this guy right here is even further up the abutment, shorter section. Uh, but they all share this pervious uh, material. In a couple of them, they have a cutoff, an upstream cutoff, uh, a tow drain. They have a blanket tow drain in this guy, and also another blanket tow drain here. The main difference between the, the sections as you go further up the abutment is that they get rid of this pervious and that's, that's an important thing that you guys will look at later. And now almost all of the foundation, they just call it overburden. Here's what those materials 
are described as, this is just from the um, construction report. So it's not that detailed. I'm not gonna go through it and read it. I'll, I'll let you guys do that, but it's, it's pretty basic, it's vague. We have some uh, more recent drilling that was done in 2020, I guess, or something like that. It gives a better description and we have lab tests that you can look at as well. That's in one of the folders. So there's a, a folder labeled boring probably. Uh, also, there are some construction gradations. I'm gonna let Amy describe to us the difference between how they, uh, the, the classification system that they used in the 40s versus the USCS system that we use now, but it was different. Um, so here are those gradations. You can see impervious, uh, where's number 200? Huh? Let's see, we have more than, uh, what is that? 0.01, so 20% or 30% passing. Random pervious, I'm gonna let you guys digest this and look at it um, later. <clears throat> these, are the, um, <laughs> these are the construction sections that they took through, through the embankment at a whole bunch of different sections. And when you look at these more closely, you'll see that they have very, very, I don't expect you to read it here, but these just say sand, 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 sand and clay, sand and clay very vague and difficult to interpret. But the point is that we're asking you to make some interpretations on some data that doesn't make exact perfect sense. So you're gonna have to interpret this a bit. Okay, then I also put together a geology map. This is just from the USGS website. It shows those two, uh, or actually a several terraces that you guys um, saw on the, on the uh, profile. These are just the descriptions that I took straight off the, ge uh, the geology map. So you can use those as a little indication of what the depositional environment might have been like um, on a pretty main major river. I put this in here, um, I probably should have taken it out, but for those, and, and, and again, we also have some experts on geomorphology. So if you're not familiar with how terraces are deposited. Um, this is just some examples of how they how they are formed, right? So they're old floodplains, and as the as the as something changes, the river drops down. It leaves that remnant terrace behind. Um, I think all of the facilitators will be able to describe to the sort of non geologists, and I think we've also split up the team so that there's a a geo person in each team. You guys know it probably well, right? Um, I put in a couple of photographs of some of the different terraces to give just a visual of what some of these sand deposits looked like. We found that it was um, pretty continuous uh, layers and deposits of sand. So as we go through these, um, we'll have some of the facilitators, you know, show where, or I, hope, I hope we have a map where these actually are from, but they're fairly uniform and fairly um, continuous over pretty pretty long distance. This is QT4. Uh, this is up the ho highest, highest terrace, up in elevation. This is QT1. So this would be down at the very lowest level near the river. Um, again, looking at like, here's some clay, some like overbank kind of flood deposits. And then underneath a pretty uh, thick deposit of sand with a handful of small um, clay layers in there. Okay, so now we're getting into some performance. Um, we have crest surveys. There's 2007 and 15 uh, pool of record information. We have some pisometers, relief wells and tow drains. Surveys have been, I think done since the 70s, or at least that's the information that we have. Um, the one thing to note here is, is most of the crest has not settled very much, maybe with the exception of this area right here, which coincides nicely with this um, Burns Run area. Um, I think it was only about half a foot though, 
So half a foot over a distance of maybe, I don't know, you guys can judge, but maybe a few hundred feet. Pool of record. So we're gonna go through what this was and, and some performance, mostly pictures. Um, let's see, high pool today, 645, that's the number I was looking for. So pool of record, 645.72 is in 2015. This is the picture. Um, they did actually have, I think they had quite a bit of erosion that happened down around these, uh, these uh, training walls here. Uh, not really part of what we're gonna be discussing, but it was a pretty big event for them. This is um, a description of, of some of the people made some notes about what they observed and not really written down in here, um, but communicated to us by some of the on-site folks was that the area on the left abutment between stations, looking at right around here, 144 to maybe 150, became very uh, soft and saturated, kind of like spongy waterbed. So as they were walking around, they were on the beach kind of like sinking down and it was spongy. And, and a lot of water was moving through the ground. So they kind of recorded what, what that was like. Um, and they also have, I think, some pictures, yeah. So they had um, sand boils that were coming out at different places. They used some sandbags to make some ring dikes like these guys. I think this is fairly typical for them. Uh, they had a number of these things. These are actually, I think, further downstream in the, in the weeds that were a little bit more difficult to detect. Um, but that was, this was a pretty typical um, performance for them. Um, in a different location, so this is actually from a levee uh, that's a little bit further upstream, had very similar problems. And the reason I put these in here is just to highlight that the, the foundation is pretty similar for a pretty far distance. This is, oh, I don't know, thousands of feet away, and they're having exactly the same problems. Um, I'll leave it at that. It's not actually our site. This is one of the areas uh, on that levee that they did some work um, with a gravel filter. This is actually in 2007, so not the 2015 flood of record. Um, but they were able to deal with their seepage issues by building this. This is a, just a map of the piezometer locations. I believe uh, in one slide coming up and also in the folders that you have, you will have access to all the piezometer information. I just highlighted these guys because they are, I just label them new. They're new relative to the 2015 flood, so they, sh they will show, um, show what water levels were doing in 2015. And they're also the furthest up the abutment that we have. Yeah, there it is. So this is just an example. You guys have this data in some of the data folders. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna go through it and try and um, show you where all these are. But obviously there's a big spike that's in the 2015 flood. And then I think I've, yeah, so we have some of those new, newer piezometers, P83, 84, and 85 in there to be able to look at what, the, what those water levels were doing hot, further up the abutment. We also have some relief wells and tow drains. This was the funkiest thing I've ever seen, but um, th there's like <laughs> a, spaghetti nest of drains all over the place. This is kind of a simplified version of what went on, but it's much more uh, spaghetti-ish and complicated than that. The gist of it was that the, um, uh, let's see, I say pink, I colored this pink and it gravity flow relief wall collectors. And then they measured it at this place, uh, OF number nine. And I believe that is in hopefully the next slide. And then the blue is this HDP pipe. Uh, it's a manifold for the pumping system uh, and, and it's the discharge for the pump is not measured, right? Those are not measured. Yep, example of what the tow drain graphs look like. So I believe that these were gonna be the outfalls, tow drain outfalls, tow drain outfall, and tow drain outfall. 
There's the one I wanted. That's a relief oil collector pipe right there. So we give you what the readings were, were for that. You can see what they did in 2015. Thank you. I think it's almost done. I'm gonna wait for some questions. Hopefully get through this. Okay, loading curve. This is gonna be used to select your critical loading. You might decide the critical load is all the way at the top of the dam. And if you do, then it's up there and that's gonna be the frequency. If you think that a critical load is somewhere lower at elevation, 650, 660, or anything in between really, you can select that and you'll have a, a frequency. So that's kind of your starting point for how to do a risk assessment, right? You need a loading or some critical load to start and then it just gets multiplied by your uh, system response. Um, I put a graph or, or a table together to have some of those, um, some of those uh, numbers just in a table for you. We put breach uh, consequences in here also so that you can plot this on an FN chart. You don't, you don't really want to uh, spend a whole lot of time with consequences because it's really not the purpose of the site characterization workshop, but we wanted to put it in here so you get a sense of what the magnitude of them are and, and give you an ability to have a plot. Okay, so this is the last couple of slides. I'm just going to show you um, this first step after you've done your data review and looked at these folders is going to be to develop a subsurface section. We have made some sections for you. So they show the geometry of the embankment. They show you the location of all the holes. Some of these are construction or pre-construction holes, right? So that was drilled before the dam was built. Others, uh, I believe like these ones here, these guys here, they were drilled more recently. You have all of the information, the boring logs for them, um, but we don't have any, we don't have any geology. We don't have any subsurface information down here. So your job is really going to be to develop that subsurface geology. And you're also going to, at the same time, try to put the soil properties and other information that you think is gonna be useful for a risk assessment on there. So that when you look at this sort of finished cross section at the end of hopefully today, you'll have some information to use uh, for building those more or less likely tables. I think there are three, uh, yep, so I I think we have one at 144, and these were selected for special reasons based on the locations of the cutoff wall uh, and some of the performance that we had. So the next one was at 150. This is a cut, cut at the very end of the cutoff wall, the sheet pile wall. And then there's one more that's further up the abutment. So the section is quite a bit smaller, the height is smaller, and um, the loading at the toe would be less frequent, right? So you're gonna need to select one of these. Um, this is going to be the event tree that we're going to use for the risk assessment, which will be on, not today, but tomorrow. It's um, a pretty standard, I think, BEP. We have a continuous layer of low CU sand exists from upstream downstream. There is an unfiltered exit at the toe. Hydraulic gradient is sufficient uh, to initiate backwards erosion piping. Materials above the developing pipe maintain a stable roof. We have sufficient flow exists uh, to advance the pipe to the reservoir. And detection and invention are unsuccessful and breach. 